I'm an avid traveler, CEO of BuddhaVideos.com, and lifelong student of the martial arts, who strives to know more about the competitors and instructors who are revolutionizing the jiu-jitsu lifestyle. Join me in my journey as I train, learn, and get rolled up. Introduced to Kung Fu as a kid, Tim Cartmel's temper for the Chinese martial arts would eventually lead him to the island of Taiwan and the temples of the mainland, where he remained for over a decade. After achieving the 8th degree black belt in Kung Fu Sansu, Tim returned to the U.S. to study Jiu-Jitsu and become instructor Kleber Luciano's first black belt. A master of leverage, Tim synthesizes his BJJ with Chinese martial art technique to create a standout style that boasts strong technique executed with relaxed demeanor. Today, I'm rolling through Ace Jiu-Jitsu School in Fountain Valley, California, where Tim is an instructor, along with co-owner Asa Fuller. I met Tim 12 years ago. I met him at Clever Luciano's gym. Uh, he was, matter of fact, Clever's very first black belt. When I started, uh, Tim Cartmel was a, uh, a purple belt already when I started training with Clever, and um, that's how I met him. And I had a hard time grasping the fact that a 150 pounder making me tap out when I, uh, when I first started, I'd been out of the Marine Corps for a year and I was like 260 pounds, way out of shape and I thought I'm going to rough these guys up and I had a hard time with those guys, you know, making me tap out. It was tough. So that's how I met Tim. Tim's, uh, the Chinese background that he brings here to the academy is mostly his self-defense, his exercises and then his takedowns. I mean, uh, it's fantastic. I mean, the angles, the, the dead angles as he calls it, um, how he takes people down and, and uses their size or their off balance to take him down or get to a more dominant position. That's the biggest thing that he's brought here to us that I didn't, he never did it at Clubbers and he's done it here and it's just fantastic. So Tim, what do you want to show today? I'm going to show a, a series of techniques set up off the side control to the stockades. So I like this technique because if you can get the initial position, the opponent's in a, in a true pin and it sets up a whole, a whole series of submissions. Let's check it out. Okay. so. I have regular side control. First thing is I have to make sure that this side elbow is not, not down in the hip. So if his arm's down, I switch my base, pull his elbow, and I kick my knees under, and I come back up. And then I underhook the head, and I make sure my elbow's inside of my knee. And I make the grip, and I pull my elbows in tight, so now your arm's exposed. So from this position, I need to push the forearm up. If I sit up and make space, he's going to start to escape. So I open my hands and I put shoulder pressure down tight on the head. So I pinch the head and I start my arm in tight to the body and I drop my elbow in against the hip so that you can't reach down and grab your fight shorts or your gi. I get it as far up as I can and then I use my body to actually move around the back and I overhook the head. So this is the start position. The, the back knee is in tight. You can hook the armpit, you can put the hand down, but you need to keep the elbow down so the guy can't get his head out. And then from this position, I can use my right hand, I'm free. And this is the pin. Okay. From this position, the fastest submission, the first one I usually do is this. I keep my elbow down tight and I slide up the chest so there's no space. And I turn my palm up so it comes under the jaw, under the chin. And I grip my hands together. I pull my hands in. My right elbow, I pull towards the shoulder. And as I bring my, sh my elbow towards the shoulder, I turn your head and bring your chin towards your chest for the choke. That's the first one. The second one, sometimes it's chin's tucked, I can't get my hand in, so I'm gonna to go to the next position and set up a whole flow of submissions. So I post my hand and I bring my bottom leg in close to your back and I keep this low and my elbow tight. And I step my foot over here and I keep it in tight here. And I fall back this way and I close my knees. I can arm bar and if it slips out, I pull in here and I make a regular arm bar. That's cool stuff, can you see that one more time? Okay, so I have the pin. I have his arm up in the back. I got this tight. I crush the head down, make sure his head's pinned. I push this out from here. I work it up as high as I can, and then I bring my hand over by closing up my leg, and I keep my elbow low to my, my hip. First one is I slide under the chin. This has to be palm up, make a butterfly grip, pull the elbow towards his shoulder, turn his head forward, and bring his chin to his chest. Second one, if I can't get the choke, I'm gonna hold this, post my hand, bring this leg in close, and I step my foot over here. Step up, and I fall back, and when I get to this position, I pinch my knees tight, lean back and bring the elbow up. If it slips, I just pull it in tight here and make an arm bar. And the foot hooked over the shoulder prevents the opponent from sitting up. It's not every day that you meet someone who has spent a large amount of their life studying Chinese martial arts, who also happens to be a black belt in jujitsu. 
I was curious to learn more about how Tim started on his path in Kung Fu in BJJ. Well, I started practicing martial arts when I was about 11, Kung Fu, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just interested in martial arts my whole life. And after college, I went to train in China. I went to the Republic of China, mm -hmm. and I practiced you know, various styles of Chinese martial arts, and I fought in a Sanda, kind of Chinese kickboxing tournaments. And then uh, I heard about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I actually, I actually saw on Black Belt Magazine a little ad for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Real Fights. It was the Gracie in Action Films, so and right. I was like, you know, I bought it to see what it looked like. And uh, I was really impressed. And I was, I was impressed by the fact that, you know, they could, the Gracie could take everyone down and people couldn't fight on the ground. So I realized that was a hole in my, my game as a martial artist. So I came back to the States in 95 uh, and just started practicing Jiu-Jitsu. My, my original idea was to just do enough to kind of get familiar with ground fighting, and then I just fell in love with the whole mm -hmm. art and kept doing it. Got hooked. Got hooked. So what, what do you take back from your Chinese martial arts training into your jiu-jitsu? I think, uh, you know, when I first started jiu-jitsu, I was, you know, I, I couldn't do any better than anybody else that hadn't trained. Mm -hmm. Not, not, nothing from the stand-up helped me directly. But I recognized uh, when, I, when I met the first Brazilian teachers that I had, the kind of body sense they had mm -hmm. and the way they use force and the way they could they kind of stick to your body and use their weight and uh, the principles of angles and leverage were, were fundamentally the same as my Chinese teachers had taught me. Mm. So I just, I recognized that kind of, um, what I thought uh, was the best way to train in that superior kind of use of your body and, and superior use of leverage. And uh, you know, the recognition of it at least really, really sparked my interest in the Jiu Jitsu. Mm. So I, I had a, and I also had a pretty good work ethic for training. Mm -hmm. So that, that helped as well. And then later on, as I got better at Jiu Jitsu, I started to see the similarities. Uh, I could feel them directly, like physically. Right. So I think in that sense, in that sense, the, the previous training helped me. Hmm. So for new students, would you recommend that they start out training in Chinese martial arts before Jiu Jitsu? Not necessarily. I think, uh, you know, complete arts, or it, it, no arts really complete maybe with, with, with every aspect of fighting, mm -hmm. but they all have their strengths and weaknesses. It depends what you're looking for, I think. So. Um, in my jiu-jitsu, when I teach jiu-jitsu, I stick with jiu-jitsu, and I might I might bring in in the self-defense, you know, maybe maybe some other other techniques that that I found to be effective. Mm. But there's really no if you're interested in Chinese martial arts and you want to do stand up, you know, that that's fine to start with. Mm. Um, if you want jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu is the thing to go to, and it also depends on your goal. If you want to compete, you know, you want to do some kind of um, MMA competition or you want to do grappling competition, you know, you you gear training towards that. If you want straight self-defense. It would be maybe a mixture of, of all the best things, you know, the best things I learned mm -hmm. from all the different styles. And obviously, uh, when it comes to ground fighting, the jiu-jitsu's the style. Right. Yeah. Do you think ground fighting is going to get more popular in China? I think so. I think uh, um, when I fought in Sanda, the, the Chinese kickboxing rules are, you know, you can strike, kick, and throw, but there's no ground fighting at all. Mm -hmm. So the, the exchange ends if someone gets knocked down or mm -hmm. thrown off out of bounds kind of thing. So, um, now they have the art of war and, and I think MMA is starting to pick up and I think China has a huge potential for MMA mm -hmm. because the, the, the Sanda is basically, basically MMA now without ground fighting. So mm -hmm. once they, they start adding in some Jiu Jitsu and some of the, the grappling, um, it'll take off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be big. Okay, from the same position, so I, I achieve the stockade here, the same thing now. I'm going to bring my left foot over. And then when I fall back for the arm bar, sometimes it starts to slip. So I cross my top leg over. Jake wants to get up. I grab my shin and I fix the triangle. So from the same position, I achieve the hook with my leg. I fall back. I'm slipping. Kick your other leg over. Grab your, your shin. Pull the triangle tight. Squeeze. Pull down with your leg. Pull the head down. Triangle. Now, if you want to go the other direction, sometimes, sometimes from the hook this way, I get this position, and I start to fall back, and I feel like it's it's, it's going to be he's going to bend his arm, I'm not going to get the arm. Or Jake tries to get up and go the other direction, so I grab the other shin and I pull it tight here, and I make the reverse triangle here and squeeze. And if the arm slips here, you have the reverse triangle armbar. See that last one one more time? Okay. So, from here, flip those through. You can come straight from here. Keep your leg down tight. You can fall straight back and pull. Make the triangle. This is tight. If his arm slips through, 
you fix it on the side, you still have the triangle and you have the arm bar. Yes, that is tight. Tim, sometimes I hear this attitude that from jiu-jitsu guys or MMA, MMA guys in particular that they don't respect traditional martial arts. Uh, do you ever get that? And, and what are your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a divide still. Um, traditional styles have, have strong points and weak points just like, like sport martial arts do. I think the, uh, the people that do things like jiu-jitsu and MMA and, and sport, combat sports um, are fighting. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're fighting, they're competing, and they're fighting even though it's within a set of rules. Uh, but there's actual resistance and, and, and contact. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the traditional martial arts don't, don't have it as much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there might be a lot of form training and basics training and maybe technique training, but not a lot of actual um, full resistance um, training like that. Yeah. So the problem with the traditional styles is a lot of times they have the idea that it's too deadly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For example, our techniques are too deadly and we can't, we can't train live. And that's a, a huge mistake, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, all all the, the primary styles that make up mixed martial arts were traditional styles, right? Mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu goes back to Japan. Um, Thai boxing's traditional, right? Mm -hmm. It's old. It's yep. all those things. So, so I think there's really not, really not, uh, there, there shouldn't be a divide between the two. I think mostly it's, it's, the, it's the training paradigm that's different. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, traditional martial artists, if they really, if they really are training for uh, actual fighting ability, need to be sparring, mm -hmm. at least in, 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 even if it's in controlled format. They have to have contact because the hallmark of a real fight is the other guy's resisting as much as possible, right? right. So you need to get, to get used to that. And I think, I think in MMA, um, you know, they shouldn't discount. I mean, you look at guys like Machida. Uh, they, everybody thought they had it all figured out, and he comes along with fundamentally traditional karate and, 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 and adds elements that, that, that people couldn't handle at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want to be closed-minded either. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to keep your, your mind open and, and, you know, not just dis discount something out of hand because they, it's traditional or it's old. Right. Yeah. What do you think you've gotten out of your traditional training that you wouldn't have got if you just studied jiu-jitsu? Um, that's hard to say. I mean, I think, I think most legitimate martial arts uh, have their complete, complete package in the sense of, uh, Kind of physical training, teaching and use your body correctly, and that kind of thing. Sometimes, technically, of course, there's there's differences. So, traditional Brazilian jiu-jitsu would have been weaker in the stand-up, obviously, than the ground fighting. The the traditional styles that I did, there was fundamentally no ground fighting. So, so technically, there's there's, uh, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses. I think the traditional styles sometimes the the well they all require discipline, mm -hmm. but sometimes the discipline emphasized in traditional styles is lacking a little bit in the in the combat sports and not not so much the discipline of guys will train really hard just discipline of of uh, focusing on the training you know like a lot of guys will just train really hard without any any direction sometimes not in the traditional martial arts that usually doesn't happen mm -hmm. so I think I think if you train in, in, a, in a combat sport or you train a traditional martial art with a with a good teacher in a legitimate style you're gonna get you're gonna get pretty much everything except maybe technical overlap mm -hmm. that's what I think mm -hmm. When guys first walk into a, a, a TMA dojo, oftentimes they comment on how strict it is and, mm -hmm. and, and how, much, how much discipline there is. Mm -hmm. Whereas a typical jiu-jitsu school is a little more laid back. You know, mm -hmm. you might be laying on the mats and, right. and uh, chatting, uh, you know, and stuff like that. Do you, do you think one approach is better than the other? I think a balance is probably, probably good. I mean, two, you're a little lackadaisical in your whole attitude. It carries over into your training. So no matter how hard you train when you spar, you know, your, your, your mental state, like your mindset is more important than anything. So I think that their tradition really helps f focus people and get their mindset dialed in. Mm -hmm. And that, that's invaluable when you're training and you're really fighting. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it, becomes, if it becomes ritualized to the point of you're just following along, you know, because everybody's doing it, and you're not really sure why, and then that, that becomes over-ritualized is, is really no, no good either. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think a balance between, you know, being serious and, and having discipline and following the rules and, and being respectful along with uh, you know it can't be too much that way you got to have fun right yeah yep. so you got to have a little fun people learn better when there's less stress so the discipline can focus people but if there's discipline to the point of ritual that causes stress it's detrimental mm -hmm. yeah so you got to find the balance point mm -hmm. it's kind of a big question but what, what's the point of all this training you know if it if it's self-defense 
I mean, I don't know about you, but street fights, street fights aren't very common, especially in Orange County. What's the point of years and years of training? I think it depends on people's motivations, but at a certain point, um, I mean, you can learn how to use a weapon and you could learn, you can learn basic self-defense in, in several months, probably enough to save you if you ever got in a fight. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something beyond that. So a lot of people start with that, then they, they get into the discipline of the whole art. But you need to have, for me, it's the underlying reason is self-cultivation. So you can go about it different ways. So you might practice in a traditional martial arts dojo where there's really no hard sparring, but the discipline itself lends the, uh, or, or, or it gives you the, the opportunity to, to cultivate yourself because you're doing something that, that's maybe hard for you and requires discipline and time and effort and you cultivate yourself as a person and you might do it with a sport martial art. You know, you train really hard and then you compete to see how you do because we all know from competing it's not, not easy, right? Mm -hmm. You got to go out in the mat or in the ring with another guy and everybody's watching. So all those things can be used as a, as a kind of self-cultivation. Mm -hmm. You know, some people might fight for the money. You know, mm -hmm. they might just love fighting. That's okay. Everyone has their own motivation. But I think for most people, they're not going to make a living as a, a pro fighter. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get in lots of street fights. They're not maybe in law enforcement or something where they're going to use it. So they choose whatever path they think is appropriate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is to kind of just self-improvement self and self-cultivation. Mm -hmm. One other thing you can do from the same setup. So I get the stockade position. I step through and right from here, I hook his armpit and I bring my bottom knee underneath his back and I hook my left leg back and pull and he's in the full stockade position here. So I have his arm trapped and I have this arm behind the other armpit, and he's right on top of my, my center. And the easiest submission is to pull his ear towards his head, right? If that's not legal, you can't do that. Keep your, top, your bottom leg hooked, hip out a little bit, push his head, triangle underneath, and then you have a triangle, and you finish the arm bar. Okay, so. Stop me. Boom. Hold his armpit, slide your knee deep, pull him on top of you, lock up your feet, he's in a crucifix. Pull his head sideways. If you can't finish that, hook, the bottom leg hooks, hip out, bring his leg in tight. The triangle usually won't choke him here, but his arm's isolated now. Arm bar. That's good. All right, so you get the position, and then slide your leg under. Right. That's it, pull me on top. Crucifix. Tim, was it tough going from being a high-ranking Chinese martial artist to a fresh beginner in Jiu-Jitsu? No, not really. I, I'd done it a couple times already. I had a kind of a high rank in the Kung Fu style I did. And then when I went to Asia, you know, it's like starting over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really don't mind that at all. I'd do it again if I found something else I wanted to train in. So it was, um, I actually liked being a student. I like I liked studying something brand new and starting off. And so that was ne never really a problem for me. I have no, uh, no problem with the you know, starting over with someone with a higher rank or anything like that. I never really did. I just like learning it. What advice do you have for the guys that might be out there that have done one thing for a long time and are interested in jiu-jitsu but are nervous about starting? It's awesome. I mean, it's awesome once you start. A mm -hmm. lot of people, I think, um, are a little intimidated. It's different and, and, and it's, it's hands-on and, you know, there's, there's, it's hard mm -hmm. at first. But I think if you like martial arts, you know, and you like, especially if you like some contact and you like the workout, I've never, I don't think I've had anybody that's ever come and tried it that just doesn't, doesn't like it, right? right? And a lot of people, they love it. They just, that's what they, all they want to do. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it depends on your, again, on your uh, purpose for training. But if you're talking about realistic self-defense, you got to have at least some, some basic ground fighting. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to round out your game as a, just a martial artist in general, it's good, it's good to learn some ground fighting. Uh, I think that most people that they're a little bit intimidated would, would start rolling and, 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 and think it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think of um, some of the newer techniques like deep half guard and X guard and things like that? I, I like the idea that jiu-jitsu is dynamic. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a set catalog of, of techniques or kata that you, you cannot go outside of. Mm -hmm. um, I think the basic techniques that, that should always be taught first because they're the ones that, that are the foundation for all the others. And they're also the ones that are going to work the best in a kind of a real, real situation if there's striking involved and all that. I think that the newer positions, more sportive, mm -hmm. um, but necessary. So 
if you give, you give people parameters, they will figure out how to win in those parameters. That's, that's the beauty of, of kind of the human mind mm -hmm. and also the sport. So I think all the new stuff is, is, is necessary. And even if you don't like it, you've got to be familiar with it if you're going to compete because it's going to be used on you. Mm -hmm. And also it just, one thing sparks the creative, uh, the, is like a creative spark for something new. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's how everyone started, right? So, so the person that invented whatever style you think is traditional, and this is the way it is, the guy that invented that style obviously did something different than, than his teacher did or he wouldn't have invented a new style. Mm -hmm. So somebody learns a, tr a traditional style and they either figure out stuff on their own or they add another style to it, then they make a synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. And then that becomes traditional. So if you get stuck in traditional, you're not doing what your teacher did, right? He had an open mind or he wouldn't have invented the style you're doing. Yep. So it's very important to, to be creative. On the other hand, you've got to realize, you know, what, what kinds of techniques work for what kinds of situations. So if you're going to spend a lot of time on, on maybe new sportive techniques, that's good for sport. But in a self-defense context, you know, you, you might not spend so much time on them. So it's important to understand what works when. But, but being, being, being open-minded and creative is, is vital if, or else things just stagnate and, and eventually die off. You made a DVD called Groundproofing. What, what was the idea behind that? Um, Groundproofing, I, I saw, what I saw was be, also because I have a lot of contact with traditional martial artists. And what I saw was there, there was a lot of people that wanted to learn enough ground fighting uh, for self-defense. And they didn't, they didn't want to compete in jiu-jitsu or submissions. Um, they weren't interested in, in grappling all the time. They just, their kind of idea was, what if I get knocked down? Mm -hmm. What if a guy knocks me down and sits on my chest, right? And I didn't really see, uh, I didn't really see anything that was addressing that. I've seen people go into... BJJ academies and say that to the instructor, like, look, I do, you know, some stand-up style or whatever. All I want, I just want some basics on the ground that'll help me survive a, a, a street fight. And the teacher goes, oh, that's exactly what we teach. And then they put him in a gi and make him start with lesson one and they just start teaching him generic jiu-jitsu and it would take the guy years to extrapolate out maybe what he needed. So my idea with the ground, ground proofing is like drown proofing. You don't have to be a, an Olympic swimmer. You just, if you fall in the water, you just don't drown. Mm -hmm. So the, what I did was I just kind of, I spent quite a bit of time organizing the material, but it's relatively simple. It's how to, how to fall, how to position yourself if you get knocked down, if your opponent's standing, and then just escapes, defenses and escapes from the most common positions you'll see in a fight, like top mount, side control, you know, a headlock, and then how to get back to your feet. It's all geared towards escaping back to your feet, whether you go through the guard to escape or you can get up directly. So if you, when I teach in a seminar format, I can teach the entire curriculum in usually a couple afternoons. And I believe really, if someone practices it a little bit, they're, they're a thousand percent safer than they would have been before they did it. And it's nothing special. Everyone that does jiu-jitsu knows all this stuff. It's just put together for, it's just streamlined for people who just want self-defense, you know, technical rise, how to kick and get up and how to escape positions. No, there's no submissions in this, the program, just escape. So I really feel it addressed that, that problem. And, and for the vast majority of martial artists who aren't into grappling, that's really all, all they need. Mm -hmm. That sounds similar to what Halio's vision was of, of the art, right? I, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with less, less of the... I think Halio also had the idea that two people are going to fight with no, no time limits, no distractions, uh, nobody helping. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a street fight I didn't. And who was, like, who was the better fighter? That's, that's one part. And then the other part was the self-defense part. And in the self-defense part, just like a traditional Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, the idea is not to take it to the ground and stay on the ground. The idea is to stay on your feet. So I think, I think that hopefully is, is, is uh, you know... Along, along the lines of that vision. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a misconception that, that some guys have about jiu-jitsu is that they think jiu-jitsu is, is worthless for the street because you wouldn't pull guard right. in the street. Yeah, I hear that a lot. That's, that's silly. Right. Right? That's a silly yeah. idea. And that's always, always, always a counter jiu-jitsu argument presented by people who have never done it and, and have never trained and don't understand it. Yeah. So, yeah. N no, I, I've never seen once a legitimate Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructor teaching self-defense and telling anybody to pull guard, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a it's all, that's an excuse people that can't grapple use. Right. So Tim, you've competed quite a bit. You won the Pan Ams two times, uh, Grappler's Quest and the Copa tournament, a few others. How is your experience competing? Uh, I like to compete. I, you know, some people compete in everything, and some people don't like it at all. I'm like in the middle. Mm -hmm. I like to do. I like to compete. Uh, it's like a test, you know, you, you, see, you see our training's going and, and the stress of competition I think is good, good to go through and you know, you get to compete with people that you don't normally roll with obviously. Mm -hmm. So I like it. I think competition's important, maybe not for everyone, you know, people, I've known, I've rolled with guys that are spectacular ground fighters that have never really competed. So, mm -hmm. but it's, it's uh, I think 
and maybe it's just a level of development. For me, I felt it, it was necessary. And I recommend it to, to most of my students, you know. I mean, not everyone competes, but you're not going to get that same level of intensity in the, in the academy. Mm -hmm. And I think the, it's the closest stress-wise you'll get to a real confrontation, you know. So you, you feel a lot of pressure and adrenaline. It's mm -hmm. almost worse, and you, every, your friends are watching, everybody's watching. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect of it. And, and just a test of how you'll do, and it, and it kind of sh will... will Competition will expose holes in your training. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're technically good, but under pressure, you, 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 can't, you can't deliver. Mm -hmm. So you got to work on that. Or maybe you know, your conditioning is not as good as you thought it was or, or, or those kind of things. So I think it's, it's, it's important. Um, and then you know, if you've done it enough, you, you, you feel like you've got that. It's, you know, maybe you don't need to compete as much anymore. But I think for most people, especially the young people, the younger guys, it's, it's really a, a great experience. And I, I recommend people competing in different venues. You know, they do some stand-up. Um, maybe submissions, you know, then they fight with the gi, and then if they want to go to MMA, that's, that's a different story. I mean, once mm -hmm. it becomes, uh, you know, MMA, it, not for everyone, because, you know, people, people just do it as a hobby, but I think at least the grappling tournaments are, are, are good for most people who practice jiu-jitsu. Did you ever get used to the, the stress of competing? Actually, over time, I, I, you know, I, com I competed in Asia, and, and uh, I got used to the stress of, this, of the, the stand-up, and then I remember my very first tournament as a blue belt. I was a blue belt, and I thought, ah, I've done this, and I was really, I was, I was, I couldn't believe how nervous I got because it was just different. Okay. So that was that was another thing that exposed, like in my own head, I thought I'm going to be calm as a cucumber, and mm -hmm. it, that didn't happen. So over time, though, as I got, I did it more and more. I got to the point where like I could kind of control the adrenaline dump, and and uh, it did really, uh, I did really uh, learn to control the the level of of stress and anxiety over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm joined here in the studio with Budo Dave. Hello, hello. So Tim used to have an, uh, his school very close to our office, but it had been an, a number of years since I trained with him. Yeah, we were both uh, blue belts, I believe, I think, the first time we went over there, right? Yeah, it was three or four years ago. And Tim is as smooth as ever. Here you see he has my toes. I thought he was waiting for something, and sure enough, there he goes for a toe hold. Yeah, that was the, the trap that I fell in over and over with Tim, is that every time I'd want to play like X guard or some type of open guard, Jump right into a heel hook or toe hold. Yeah. What did you feel like? I mean, w w explain his his game to people that are watching this. Well, Tim's only 150 pounds, so he, he doesn't have a lot of weight, but he's a master of leverage and he's very calm. You won't see him overexerting himself. He's very smart jiu-jitsu, doesn't take a lot of risks. You see, you see him just keeping me away, holding my ankle. Yeah, he's extremely relaxed. Mm -hmm. Here he's going to pull me right into his guard. Did he feel strong to you? He didn't feel strong, but he has that relaxed strength that um, I feel from some of the really experienced guys. He didn't feel really explosive, um, but but very stable. Right. Explain relaxed strength. That's a difficult thing um, to teach, but I think it just comes from confidence in your movements, and it's not a, a tightening of your muscles, but just maintaining your, your posture, maintaining your base. What did you think was the most difficult thing uh, to deal with uh, with Tim? I remember when I was rolling with him, it was he would just constantly drop into foot locks or heel hooks, um, but now. You have much more experience, obviously, with heel hooks and leg locks. Um, what was, what did you feel was the, mo the most challenging part? You know, I think Tim was just playing a little conservative and and smart. So it just it was just hard to uh, to, to do much, you know, against a guy that's not going to take too many risks. Here he's holding my uh, my wrist, and I get my hand a little bit too low. I fall into his his triangle in a moment here. There I go, I'm pushing on his knee, trying to kind of Sao Paulo pass and fell right into the triangle. And you see with my left hand, I'm hiding that behind his hip so he can't bring my hand across the triangle. I was hoping he'd transition to an omoplata, but like I said, he's playing a smart conservative game and he knew he had the triangle locked up and we stayed here for a while. Just making small little adjustments, getting his feet tight. Yeah, he's not taking your bait, is he? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to break the grip on the arm.
but he knew he had the, the triangle locked up. He knew I wasn't going to be able to get out. Looking back on it, I should have tried to stand up and try one of the standing escapes. And yeah, there he there pulls, down, is, pulls down the head and gets it. It wasn't until after this roll that I learned that Tim was 50 years old. Yeah, in watching him warm up before this was actually really amazing. You can see how flexible he was, um, what amazing shape the guy's in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's in the kind of shape that most people would dream to be in at that age. Yeah. And the fact that he's still practicing jiu-jitsu every day and has a, a very high-level uh, jiu-jitsu game. Mm -hmm. Very open-minded guy. I, nothing about him seems like 50 years old. Right. And I, I'm sorry we didn't get this on, on film, but I heard that he could walk the perimeter of the mats on his hands, doing a handstand the whole way. Yeah, that's awesome. That's something I could never, ever do. Mm -hmm. Now, this was my, one of my, well, maybe my favorite parts, but <laughs> <That> was <so laughs> I was filming from the other side of the mat, just seeing you're, you're just watching you grimace. Yeah. It just seemed really uncomfortable. Uh, another thing about Tim that's really hard to see on the video is the amount of pressure that he's been able to apply from side control. Yeah. Um, I would honestly say that even with all the guys that I've rolled with, a lot of high-level high guys, that, that was one thing that was really unexpected from him, is that he has this am amazing top pressure from side control. It's so uncomfortable. Did it feel different this time around? Um, no, I mean, you're right, he's, he's a master at applying his weight, he only has 150 pounds, but that's something that's very hard to teach, but he's a master at it. Yeah, this, I guess it just comes from years and years of experience, I don't think there's really any, well maybe there is, I don't know, but like a secret to it of just years of practice, and I'm sure that his experience in Chinese martial arts probably helped him understand that concept a lot better. Yeah. I'm trying with my uh, leg work to to recover half guard, but Tim has a really good mount. I'm not get my legs free. Yeah, again, very poised, very relaxed. Mm -hmm. Now he gets a Nogi Ezekiel here on me. Which isn't the common move. Yeah, I think I fell victim to that once or twice. <laughs> the path of the martial artist is rarely an obvious one. It meanders, forks, and the terrain can change in an instant. Tim's journey led him from the U.S. to China in an effort to master fighting styles of a certain type, only to return home so that he could conquer others. There and back again, from student to master, Tim's open mind and ambitious spirit have positioned him as one of the most learned and versatile ambassadors of the martial arts in the world. His dedication to the discipline should serve as a lesson to the rest of us, and as an inspiration to keep on rolling. advice that I like to, to pass on my students, you know, you want to be, get better, you know, have your mind open, no ego, and then improve all the time.